Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. I'm Eric Auskerson, one of the hosts for today's webinar. We've been conducting these for the past two months. Actually, this is a 10 to 10 hall we've had in a row on Thursday at, at, at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we have a great program uh, in, in store for you. We greatly appreciate uh, being with you every week. We learn a lot as well uh, from your questions. So please uh, you know, start asking them. Uh, but one thing I do wanna bring to your attention is that we've got our frequently asked question document in your material section. And just a couple of quick housekeeping comments. Uh, there's a toolbar at the bottom. You can click on materials to, receive, to get the, the, today's presentation and, and other materials that we've, we've, we'll be talking about today, including uh, the, the FAQ document. In addition, you will uh, receive CPE if you're watching the live version. If this is the archive version, you will not. And at the end of the event, um, you can click on the CPE button to get your certificate. And don't worry if you don't receive it uh, at the end of this session, you will receive an email uh, about it. So let me now introduce uh, today's presenters. I'm Eric Auskerson, the President and CEO of CPA.com. Uh, this is a very, very busy time for us as we work with firms and help them play their, their critical trusted advisor role. Uh, with me is, is Mark Koziel, uh, who you all well know. He leads the firm services area for the AICPA, and he's been extremely busy over the past couple of months uh, talking to firms on a, on a daily basis. Uh, we've got a, a practitioner, um, a leader uh, with us today from Grant Thornton. His name is Doug uh, Crisitello, and uh, he's been a uh, managing director at Grant Thornton for a number of years. Uh, but earlier in his career, he actually uh, worked at the uh, SBA. So he's got a great background, and, and he's going to help uh, talk about some of the additional programs, the IDLE program, Main Street program, uh, that, that are in place, and, and we're going to be digging a little bit deeper into that. And also with us is, uh, is Lisa Simpson. Uh, it's her team who's been uh, building all of the great resources uh, that are available on the AICPA PPP uh, Resource Center site, and, and she'll be uh, talking about uh, the latest uh, related to them shortly. Uh, so our agenda is we're going to kick it off just talking broadly about what's happened over the past week. Then we're going to, you know, share what's the latest uh, with the SBA and Treasury guidance, and then we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into the Idle and Main Street lending programs uh, with Doug, and then we'll we'll move into open forum, and we'll also try to take a couple of questions uh, during the, the 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 session prior to the open forum session. So first off, you know, we always talk about what's happening uh, with the stakeholders. I mean, this has been such a defining time for all of us. And what happened last Friday with the release of the uh, unemployment numbers, uh, the fact that you know, May had uh, an increase of, uh, of employment by 2.5 million, that's a, that's a record, a historical um, record. All of these different groups talked about you know, the role that the PPP program has played in you know, keeping these small businesses intact. Uh, yesterday, uh, Secretary Mnuchin was talking uh, at, during some Senate testimony about what, what occurred due to the PPP program. We've been seeing uh, firms and some banks, um, you know, putting out uh, advertisements, essentially talking about how they have supported X number of clients and really helped them uh, get the, the necessary business relief. Uh, so I just think that's something that uh, we should all be proud of is what has, a, what has happened um, in this incredible marathon that we've been in for the past 75 days. When we look at the major phases, we all know uh, that we've in some ways been in this forgiveness and compliance phase, but actually, as, as, as we're gonna discuss today and we step back, we're, we're back in you know, the application process. There's, I, was, there, I was talking to a firm uh, this week that had submitted five new, app, new PPP applications. And we also know there's activity in, in the other uh, business relief programs. So we're really in this business relief phase, which is still about you know, applying for relief and, and this forgiveness and compliance stage uh, due to the PP Flexibility Act is now gonna push out 
uh, you know, throughout 2020 and even go into 2021, and we'll be talking a little bit about that today as well. And restart and recovery is happening. Last week we talked about that, and we're going to continue to talk about tools that are that are important for firms to be leveraging to help their clients uh, with with restart. So let's just take a quick look at the latest SBA uh, PPP numbers. Once again, it's basically flat. Uh, it's been at around $511 billion for the past few weeks. Yesterday, uh, Mnuchin stated that $12 billion had been uh, uh, returned uh, to, to the program. So that's one of the reasons why it, it stayed flat. The other reason is there's a number of double applications. It, it is growing um, you know, at about a half a billion dollars a week over the past two weeks. We expect to see that to increase, you know, much more in the coming weeks um, due to the PPP Flexibility Act and those, those terms being uh, terms that more businesses can take advantage of. And there's still $130 billion in funding, so we are encouraging firms to, to talk to their clients and to make sure that they don't have any clients that could use this business relief because the deadline is June 30th. Let's just talk a little bit about what's going on with the policymakers uh, and at, at Treasury and SBA. You know, first off, there was uh, you know, important testimony by Secretary Mnuchin and Administrator Carranza yesterday uh, at the Senate Small Business Committee. And Mnuchin, you know, he had, he had, he had you know, a number of comments uh, you, you can watch the archive uh, uh, via, uh, you know, uh, online resources. But two things that he, he mentioned that I want to share with you. One was there was lots of questions around simplification. What is Treasury doing to, to simplify the process? And, and actually, uh, Secretary Mnuchin brought up a forgiveness calculator uh, that he, he saw. And we're, we're rather sh uh, sure that that third-party forgiveness calculator he was referencing was the one that Lisa and her team uh, had put together. And he mentioned that these tools are helping uh, with the process. And Treasury is also thinking about ways that they can uh, simplify uh, the PPP forgiveness phase. So more to come there. He also stated that they were not going to be making the, the names of the recipients of the PPP loans public. Uh, you know, this is something that's contrary to some of the policymaker statements that have occurred over the past couple of months. And we've also stated on this call that this information does fall under uh, FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act. That was on the application. So we, we think there's, that that still is a, a, a clear risk and something that you should be telling your clients that this may be disclosed or potentially um, this may be kept uh, private. And I'm sure a lot of the uh, small businesses would appreciate it uh, to be kept private. Moving on uh, now to this new bill. There's a, a, a bill by three senators, three Democratic senators, Cardin, Coons, and Shaheen. Uh, and they have put a PPP2 bill in place. They're calling it P4 because it's going to be prioritized PPP. And it's going it, to, it's, it's focus is on businesses with less than 100 employees, and also there are a number of conditions. You'll have had to have a 50% drop in revenue. This is a long ways from uh, you know passing, and what we are seeing is discussions around any you know future PPP2 um, acts to clearly include conditions. So it's very unlikely that you're going to have. Uh, a program like the one we have right now uh, that is, is is open and is flexible. The next programs they're just they're just going to put more criteria around them. And then finally, CARES 2.0 and, and the Phase 4 discussions. With the, the discussions that are occurring on the Hill are that we still have about a one and a half trillion dollars of the CARES 1.1 Act that has not been um, uh, taken advantage of. So a lot of the senators and, and Congress, uh, uh, congressmen and women feel that that needs to be utilized to a greater degree before they really start moving forward uh, with CARES 2.0. So Mark Kozil, I don't know if there's anything that, that you want to add 
uh, to what I just said. And Mark Peterson's actually off giving another presentation right now, uh, and he might he leaves the advocacy area of the AICPA, and he might be back with us next week. But Mark, I'll, I'll let you uh, maybe fill any any gaps that I left out. Thanks, Eric. And yeah, to the to the Cardin Coon Sheehan to Shaheen bill, uh, you know, without seeing Republican support, the likelihood of passage early uh, is going to be a challenge. Obviously, I mean, I think we've been pretty transparent in all of our town halls uh, to tell you the likelihood of some of these going uh, based on what we know, and and none, none of these are guarantees. Uh, but I think we were pretty early on with the Flexibility Act, confident that that was going to go through. So, Eric, your, your summary of that was great. One other item to add to this uh, is the, uh, the bill, uh, and I'm trying to think, S3612, introduced by Senator John Cornyn uh, from Texas uh, about the deductibility of PPP expenses. Uh, it does have some support. Uh, however, uh, again, passage, if they don't get moving quickly on this, uh, uh, could be a challenge. I know some of you have sent us emails saying, hey, we got to get some of our estimated tax payments. This is going to matter. We need to know now uh, whether or not it's going to be deductible. Uh, we sent a letter of support to this bill uh, today. This all dropped today. Uh, but, uh, you know, how likely is this one? We're, we're not ready to uh, handicap just yet uh, as to the likelihood of passage. Uh, we are hopeful, uh, and we will continue to support it. We will continue to work on the Hill to make it happen. We're fairly comfortable that you will see something by the end of the year. We still have time, obviously, for uh, the full effect, uh, but there seems to be this groundswell inside the Hill to, to make something like this work. So uh, only time will tell whether or not it's this bill that makes it all the way through or not, uh, but we'll keep an eye on it. Thanks, Mark. So, yeah, we will continue. It was a busy week in D.C., and we're going to continue to stay very in tune with what's going on there. So here's just the media focus for this week. You know, a lot of discussion about some of these, these, these additional programs, uh, the expansion of the Main Street lending program, we'll, we'll be getting into that. And then just a lot of press related to the uh, the unemployment numbers. Uh, today's markets are obviously going, you know, going in a, in, a, in a different direction. So just a lot of volatility out there, um, but uh, a lot of discussion around what what this uh, these business relief programs mean to keeping the economy going and, and just as importantly, keeping uh, our small business community uh, intact. So, Mark, why don't I turn it back over to you to talk about, you know, any uh, the recent guidance that, that came out over the past few days. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, and the, you know, I, I wish I had more news to talk about. Uh, as we've said over the last couple of weeks, we are aware that there's going to be additional guidance. I see again in our Q&A, our question area, a lot of people asking questions about, uh, you know, can I deduct this? Uh, is, is it 8, 10, 12, or 24? Do I have my options? Uh, all of that needs definitions around it. And as soon as we can get greater clarity and how that will generate more questions, we'll be able to get to that point. We're kind of leaving Treasury and SBA alone here for a little while, let them try and get caught up on trying to get those things done. It's a lot of work. We're even hopeful that uh, the application, I know there was the first version of the application that came out. Uh, I believe that you may see some level of a simplified version of that based on feedback that we've provided and others have been provided that we are not quite done with seeing how that application is going to look. Uh, so we have to be patient. Uh, you know, I have uh, Lisa and Brad and Carrie, they're all on right now and they all continue. We take shifts, hitting the refresh button, being on the treasury.gov, waiting for this thing to drop uh, any day. Uh, we just don't know when. It's probably a lot of work to make that happen. But there are a few things that happened this week since our last town hall. Number one, uh, there was an IFR, IFR1 update that hit their website today. Uh, and this, this update basically just uh, updates IFR1 for the changes based on the Flexibility Act. Now, there are still not a lot of great answers that are inside of that, but there are a few nuances to that uh, to talk about. First and foremost, while the Flexibility Act 
uh, allows for a five-year repayment term, it is specific in uh, this IFR that uh, all loans prior to June 5th uh, at the mutual agreement of the borrower and the lender can choose to extend from two years to five years. So that means that the banks are going to have to be involved in that decision-making process you know, if it does go to a loan. I mean, obviously, you don't have to have that conversation if we're going to get full forgiveness, but you're going to have that. Any any loan that happens after June 5th, so all the loans in place that we're helping clients to do right now, anything after June 5th would automatically be the five-year term. So that's one thing to highlight. And then if we go to the next slide, uh, there was a statement that came out, uh, and I know that when we reported on this last week, this is based on the way that Treasury understood it and a variety of the practitioners that we talked to understood it. There was a statement that came out on June 8th uh, that actually described the 60-40 not as a cliff, as we reported last week, but rather that uh, it will reduce the amount of forgiveness if your payroll is below 60% of the, the total cost. So you will be limited to uh, not more than uh, 40% of your other expenses being in things that are outside of the payroll. So that's good news, actually, in this, because we said it's going to make a tougher planning process, or you're going to have to plan more. Do you take the eight weeks and the 75% knowing that you'll get partial forgiveness, or do you take the chances on the 24-week and 60% if you don't hit it? Uh, it's a cliff. That no longer is the case. They were better to define that. We're very happy with that result. I think that was the intent of what they, where they were going. So that is a, a big change from what we reported on last week. Eric? Yeah, and, and, and what we now, uh, you know, here, here's this loan forgiveness calculator that's becoming famous. Uh, so I'll have Lisa uh, cover this. But just one, one point that we're going to continue to make is that we think many, most firms, are, and, you, and all firms, should really start the, the application, uh, forgiveness application process more in July. Wait for all this guidance to come out. Wait for us to update all of the uh, the calculators because you're going to have time. Clearly, you want to understand the, the new rules here so you can do planning, but to actually, uh, you know, sit down and do the work, we want to make sure we've got all the guidance baked in and to be determined if it will be this week or next week. So, Lisa, why don't you, you know, share the latest on, on the forgiveness calculator? Thanks, Eric. As you can see, we are, as you've been hearing us say, waiting on uh, the additional guidance, so please do check back with us. Um, one thing I will point out is that we have a summary of the PPP Flexibility Act. It was in last week's materials. If you didn't grab it then, you can um, find that on our site at AICPA.org slash SBA. So that's going to give you the highlights of what happened what the changes are from the Flexibility Act, and it's also going to tell you some of the questions that we simply don't have the answers on yet. I see a lot of questions coming through the chat about um, is the compensation limit going to go from 15385 to um, 46000 or whatever the number is. We simply don't know how that's going to be interpreted. We, we have um, hunches, but my hunch changes on a daily basis. So can't give you a good answer there. Um, also, lots of questions about when to apply for forgiveness. So as Eric just mentioned, um, you can wait. We don't even have an application for forgiveness right now. So we'll need to wait until that comes out. Yesterday in uh, Senator or, um, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin's testimony, he did say that borrowers could apply for forgiveness once the application is out there. They don't have to wait until the end of the 24 weeks. But what we don't know is how the FTE safe harbor is going to play into that. So uh, again, lots to come on that, but uh, just, just be patient with us as we wait for that guidance. Once the guidance is out, we'll get that calculator updated as quickly as we can. We also will be tweeting about it once it's up on the site and, and revised for full implementation of the Flexibility Act. So follow us on Twitter and you can get the latest breaking news. Thanks, Lisa. So we, we've been, Al, maybe let Mark, you you just kind of jump in and just kind of, I've mentioned this a couple of times, why don't you just give your perspective on, on the firm focus right now? 
Thanks, Eric. Yeah, so, you know, it really is this big final push. I'm hopeful that you can reach out to those clients that may have been on the bubble and say, you know what, uh, we, we may have started down the process. Now would be the time to push the button. Uh, we have till June 30th to make it happen. You now have 24 weeks. We have a little better clarity. For those who were holding off or, or knew that due to local restrictions or just outright their business was down, uh, and couldn't bring the employees back. It is really a good time to get this done. You know, June 30th also has the safe harbor on the uh, on the salary calculation, but the FTE calculation now goes out to December 31. Uh, you know, it's never been a better time to apply. I mean, they are trying to get closer to everyone being as forgiven as possible on this process. So really, I mean, it's important to get out to your clients that have suffered, have trouble getting employees back uh, to, to really get that last $130 billion that's out there. As far as helping clients with, uh, you know, business relief options and restart, we started to make that shift. We had uh, part of the uh, engaged conference process. Eric, Lisa, and I were on a special town hall we did on Tuesday. We had a couple of practitioners with us. This is a great advisory opportunity. I mean, now's the time to start talking to your clients and going through scenario planning and, and cash flow analysis and what if analysis around what revenue is going to look like. Do I need to revamp what my business looks like? How should I refocus on what I do? Clients are all wondering these things. It's a great time to reach out and, and do that. And then finally, Eric had already said this on the forgiveness application, but you know, I don't know how we're going to be able to apply for forgiveness if we don't have an application or we don't know what an application looks like. And I realize we're trying to get as, as far ahead of that as humanly possible. Uh, but from what we read in uh, the, the regulations, you have up to 10 months to the, from the end of your coverage period to be able to apply for that forgiveness. So that means that if uh, the earliest side of getting this money in April 15th, and we did the eight-week process of around June 15th would be the earliest that the coverage period would end. Uh, so now you got 10 months from that standpoint, right? So you're looking at uh, basically April-ish of 2021 to get that application. I know all of you are not going to want to be dealing with this around March or April of 2021, uh, but there is going to be that opportunity to kind of go through this a little bit slower, let everything get baked. And as you've seen all along, you know, speed isn't going to be the benefactor here necessarily because they keep changing the rules. Uh, who knows if the first tranche of support comes and yet the next tranche only changes the game a little bit. So, you know, we could be a little more patient on this forgiveness side than we were on the application side. And I hope we take advantage of it. I know it's a hard conversation with the client, but, you know, you got to let them, got to let them know and that based on what we've seen so far, getting this done quickly does not necessarily mean we're going to win faster. Eric. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Well, now let's, you know, over the last two weeks, we, we always are watching, uh, you know, and reading all the questions, responding to as many as we can. But IDLE, IDLE's been uh, number one. People have said, please, please uh, talk about IDLE. So that's what we're doing right now. We've got, we've got an expert here with Doug. So he's going to talk both about IDLE and Main Street. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome, Doug. Great, thank you. Let's jump into it, talk about the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. A, a key difference between EIDL and the PPP or even the Main Street Lending Program is that this is a pre-existing program. It's been around for many years. Uh, it's typically used for uh, losses resulting from physical disasters, so a actual physical losses. Um, you know, think hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, those types of incidents. Uh, uh, but SBA also makes assistance available to firms that suffer economic losses that are attributable to a physical uh, event, notwithstanding the fact that the, the business might not have been uh, affected at all. Um, at least physically, right? So the entire nation has been designated as a, as a disaster area. So all firms are eligible for economic uh, injury disaster loans. And one key advantage 
of the EIDL program is that uh, there's a huge amount of money available and SBA is in the process of uh, reviewing millions of loan applications. So to date, as of uh, this weekend, uh, SBA had approved, had funded 1.1 million loans for about 80 billion. They still have nearly 300 billion in lending authority, uh, along with about 4 million pending applications. Uh, and th this is a huge volume. You know, we're, we're talking about records earlier in the conversation here. SBA is shattering records every day, whether it's with the volume of lending through PPP, uh, which is part of the 7A program, or uh, the, the sheer volume on disaster loans here has just been unprecedented. You know, they did more loans in, uh, since March than in the entire history of the program. Uh, so loans are normally capped at uh, two million. That right now they're operating under a smaller, uh, a, a, a smaller, uh, lower ceiling. Um, uh, but uh, we expect, and and they're limiting applications to agricultural related enterprises right now. But we expect uh, that to be that restriction to be lifted next week. So uh, let's move to the next slide, and. Um, uh, uh, Im important to note that, uh, can we go to the next slide? Am I just delayed a little bit here? Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, Doug, so, it might be yeah. just refresh. It should, I, be, it should be up now. Yeah, I got it. So uh, just some frequent questions that uh, we're hearing from firms about you know, should they consider an idle or uh, Main Street uh, lending program uh, assistance versus PPP? Well, you know, I, I, I think it's um, handy to sort of put these programs into different baskets. The Main Street <clears throat> lending program is really aimed at larger firms, so larger, small firms. So uh, from 500 to 15,000 employees, although you don't have to have 500 employees, you can have fewer. Um, but that, that's how it was originally conceived. Um, you know, the loan amounts are higher, but it's a shorter term loan. And it's aimed, it, it's aimed at facilitating uh, uh, the leveraging of existing credit lines. Um, SBA loans are, are directed at smaller firms. Uh, SBA size standard thresholds apply. The loan amounts are uh, can, can be lower. The minimum Main Street program uh, uh, loan is 250k. Um, SBA's disaster loans can be substantially smaller. And the terms for idle loans are uh, significantly longer, so up to 30 years. Uh, a question here on uh, whether a borrower using an idle can make escort distributions or partner distributions. The idle proceeds are uh, can be used very flexibly. Uh, they're to cover uh, operating expenses that cannot be paid because of the disaster. So there's a huge amount of flexibility in utilizing idols, unlike PPP, where uh, it, it, at least in the original CARES Act, there were lots of restrictions about how, how PPPs could be used to achieve forgiveness. Um, idle, it's not unlike just getting a, a loan for for general operating expenses. Importantly, you can't use idols and PPP for the same purpose. Um, so if you use your PPP loan to pay, uh, to fund payroll for, let's say, May and June, you couldn't use idle proceeds for that same purpose, but you could use it to fund payroll in July and August, and so on. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. I think... Uh, you, I mean, uh, with this, we've got some questions coming in here, Lisa. Do you want to maybe just pick one related to idle? I see one about... You know, idle and, and 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 PPP. So I'll let you let you select. Yeah, we've gotten several questions, and I'm, I I think you answered 
that idle loans have a lot of flexibility in how they're used. Just a couple of questions. Can they be used for capital purchases? I, um, uh, they can be used for uh, fixed debts, payroll, accounts payable, those types of uh, expenses. If, if, if someone is interested in securing SBA credit for, for a capital expense, I would encourage them to look at the Section 504 Certified Development Company Program. That's awesome. That's great advice. Um, we've also gotten a question about, can you use it to pay off a line of credit? I think, I, I think that would be permissible. Oh, that's interesting. And we, we're suddenly getting questions, can it be used to pay off credit card debt? So we'll, um, lots of questions about how to use idle loans. We have, um, so we can we can come back to those and build out some additional resources around what is and is not allowed for an idle loan. If, but but if once again, I place. think it's important to emphasize that idols are loans, and PPPs are intended to be grants. So there's a lot more conditions around PPPs than there would be for an idol, because if you take out an idol, you're expected to repay it. The, you know, it's a good interest rate. Three, three and three quarters percent, uh, long term up to 30 years. But the expectation is that you're going to repay it. So there's a lot of flexibility in how you can use the proceeds. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll come back uh, in open forum and, and talk some more about IDLE potentially as well as PPP. But let's, let's pivot now and just provide the updates related to Main Street Lending, Doug. Yeah, so the Main Street Lending Program is funded through the Treasury Department. So Treasury was provided with several hundred billion dollars to ensure credit availability for, uh, you know, for middle market firms. Um, tr Treasury is backstopping the, the Federal Reserve, which is cre creating and operationalizing this program. The operational arm at the Fed is the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Um, and um, the, uh, this is a loan guarantee program. Uh, the, the term, you know, we've, t we've talked some about the terms. Uh, uh, there'd be a deferment on uh, repaying principal for two years. Uh, the the long term though the overall long term is rather short compared to the disaster loan program at five years, but the idea here is that w the Fed would take off the balance sheets of lenders any uh, loans that they've made under the program to small firms, and the Treasury would backstop uh, the Fed for any losses that are incurred on that portfolio. Um, so I, I think it's an attractive program for firms that are eligible for SBA assistance. Makes a whole lot of sense to, to uh, compare and contrast this not only with IDLE, but some of the other SBA programs as well. So we can talk a little bit, Lisa, why don't you talk a little bit about um, some of these tools and, and, then I'll, and, then, and then Doug can maybe comment a little bit further. Yes, we, um, as Doug mentioned, there are other options within SBA for different type of loan programs that they offer. Within our um, PCPS resources, we have a chart that lets you quickly and easily compare the terms and the usage of the different types of programs. So you'll see the link to that in the slide. And we just wanted to highlight that PPP and IDLE are not the only options, and, and Doug is a, a great resource for that, that type of insight. Yeah, um, importantly, some of, some of your clients may be uh, existing 7A or 504 borrowers. 7A is the big SBA program in normal times. That's that's a general business loan guarantee program. So SBA is doing um, a, a couple of things for existing and new borrowers. Uh, 
uh, under the 7, 8, 504, and microloan programs. SBA is actually picking up six months of principal and interest payments for those programs. Again, both for existing borrowers and for new loans that are made uh, through September 27th. That's six months after enactment of the CARES Act. Uh, that's not a deferment or a grace period. That's actually paying P&I. So that, that's very attractive. And then for firms that are uh, awaiting uh, uh, idle proceeds, uh, they're able to quickly access $25,000 through uh, SBA Express lenders, sort of, uh, I, I'm reluctant to use the term advanced, but it's sort of because it's not, uh, it's not a grant, it's not forgivable, but they can get a, a, a short-term bridge loan to uh, while awaiting uh, their idle application to be processed. Well, th thanks, Doug. We'll be, we'll be coming back to you. And one other point I'll make with you know the webinar platform here. This is a little bit of an eye chart. You can expand uh, the window for the slide, and that still may not be large enough. And what you can do is just go to to the uh, AICPA website there, and you can you can download uh, that that Excel tool. So uh, m more uh, investment on our side will go into understanding all of these different. SBA programs uh, as you continue the business relief discussion with your clients, as we've said from day one, it's even though PPP was a very attractive and, uh, and an important option to be discussing with your clients, there's many options looking at the overall, you know, business relief choices for them, what's the best one for your client. In some cases, uh, it's multiple, uh, multiple programs. As, as we've just been discussing, we're going to keep tracking these additional relief programs on, on, the, on the far far right, and uh, we also will be, uh, and thanks for advancing that slide, and we'll also be talking more about potentially uh, employee retention credit in uh, future weeks. That's, that's a program that we know is, is very attractive to, to all businesses. Uh, one, there is one factor you cannot uh, be in the PPP program, though, if you go if you take advantage of the employee retention credit. So, Mark, I'm going to let you um, you know add a few more comments and then go to the next slide and talk about the accounting uh, for PPP loans. That's great. Uh, as long as you don't ask me about the accounting for PPP loans, they kick me out of accounting now after all these years. The but with these programs, it was a great summary. There's a couple of things to highlight in this. I think number one. The payroll tax deferment. Uh, that deferment, uh, when originally published between that and PPP, was that you could not defer uh, any of the payroll taxes that were part of or under the PPP loan uh, or PPP borrowers. Well, they've now, through the Flexibility Act, uh, they've changed that, and now it does allow for PPP borrowers uh, uh, to be eligible, uh, whether or not you forget that their loan gets forgiven or not. Uh, they can also defer the payroll taxes. So that's a big deal, I think, to say that uh, the, those borrowers can also participate in that program. One of the things to follow up to uh, Doug's comments on Main Street Lending, you see here in the timeline uh, that the MSL was actually revised on June 8th. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that the word on the street, the press, the media, uh, the banks, and a lot of companies in general just didn't like the deal. Uh, and so they tried to make it more attractive now. And to Doug's point, it probably is more attractive. They, you know, extended the repayment term. They extended the uh, the deferral on, on the, the interest. Uh, they did not change the interest rate. That still stays the same. Uh, so the, and, and how much more that is going to be guaranteed by the government, because the banks had a lot of pushback on this, too. So it'll be interesting. And it still isn't up and running yet, by the way. Uh, and hopefully it's getting closer to be able to do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's going to take some convincing of the banks to be able to get there on that program. And we still haven't seen it yet utilized, uh, but it could still be an option down the road. It is better. I don't know that it will ever be perfect, but uh, hopefully it's good enough now to get people to start using it. Eric? Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about accounting. Is this Mark or Lisa who's going to cover this one? 
I'm going to cover this one. Thank you, Eric. Uh, it, it's really interesting because just before I um, stopped looking at the Q&A to, to talk about this slide, we got a question. Can we please cover accounting for PPP loans on an upcoming town hall? And for any of you Princess Bride fans, as you wish. So here we go. Just this week, the AICPA issued some non-authoritative guidance on accounting for PPP loans. We've got links embedded into the slides for you. You'll actually get a link to the guidance, and this is for non-governmental entities. It also applies to NFPs, both public and private business entities. There's a great Journal of Accountancy article that provides a summary as well. It's important to note that we are working on guidance for governmental, healthcare, and lender Q&As. Those will be coming soon. We had such a robust program today that we don't have time to get into examples of how to do the accounting, but please do uh, keep an eye out because we'll be bringing in some of our accounting wizards to go through some examples with you at a future town hall. So we'll be digging into that in the future, but we just wanted to make sure that you knew that uh, some non-authoritative guidance came out just this week. Thanks, Lisa. Well, let's now just, you know, open this up. We've got a little bit more time this week for some questions. So let's, at least you, you and your team, let's, let's start identifying a few of the, the major, major themes. And uh, which, where, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with PPP? Yeah, there's a, a little bit of confusion about how the idle emergency grant plays into PPP forgiveness if you got both. And, if you look at the loan application or the forgiveness application, you'll see that SBA has indicated that they will subtract the amount of the emergency advance from the amount of PPP loan forgiveness. That's not actually on the face of the forgiveness application. It's in the instructions. So that, that is going to be subtracted from the amount of forgiveness. Uh, another question we've gotten quite frequently is, is, is there anything new about the July 15th filing deadline. Mark or Eric? I could take it, Lisa. Yeah, so, um, yes, there continues to be dialogue uh, in D.C. about it. Uh, there are certain groups that are supporting the extension of that. We are not one of those groups. Uh, we are, uh, we would be opposed to any type of uh, proposed legislation right now to extend beyond July 15th. There was even rumor that someone was saying to push it off all the way to April of 2021. I mean, that's just, uh, you know, talk about double duty to work for next year. Um, there's a lot of at play to it, though, as well. Uh, out of necessity, the IRS, if the IRS is not back up and running uh, at some acceptable level by July 15th, uh, then it may necessitate uh, the, the extension beyond July 15th. Uh, there, there's a backlog of all of the, or I think they process somewhere around maybe 20% of the paper returns that have been in. Uh, there's limitations on the number of personnel that could be in the office. They're still not back 100%. They cannot process uh, outside of their four walls. So there's just a lot of issues around that. Uh, we're going to continue to encourage that July 15 remains the date, uh, but uh, it, it still remains to be seen as to what's going to happen with that. Eric, anything to add? No, I think that was a great summary, uh, Mark. So, but if you pass it to me, I just a couple of um, questions. Just on the past, some people are asking about the past town halls. That we have all of our past town halls in the AICPA TV. One way to uh, you find all these is through our our Twitter uh, feeds too. We always, uh, as soon as it's available uh, under my Twitter feed, Eric Ouskerson, or, or Lisa's or Mark's, we're, we're posting that information. So that back to you, Lisa, with. Uh, Maybe some some additional questions that your team is is pulling out. Yeah, let me take a, a quick look here. Um, we're still getting some questions about the uh, uh, compensation limits on eight versus twenty four weeks. So again, just keep coming back to the town halls, and and we'll answer that question for you as soon as we can. Um, we've gotten some questions about 
if a if a borrower initially took a PPP loan and then returned the money, but now because of the 60-40 split and the 24-week covered period versus the eight-week covered period, they're interested in trying to reapply. Uh, we're also getting questions about um, for people who are interested in applying by June 30. We're having trouble finding um, lenders to accept their applications. Any suggestions on those? Yeah, I'll um, I'll uh, do the first one. What if for some reason you when they they applied for the PPP loan and they didn't get the the maximum loan amount, uh, then they if they have if they if they do. Um, uh, go through the forgiveness process uh, or, or pay it back, they can then, our understanding is, apply for a new PPP loan. And then there's some instances that we heard where someone just returned the money uh, due to a lot of the noise that was in the system, and, and, and they're like, well, can I now reapply? And the answer, the answer is yes. So uh, as always, go to your lender. Um, but to, once it's, it's been paid back, our understanding is you, you can uh, re, reapply, um, but you need to work that through your lender. Yeah, Eric, to that point, I mean, some of the issue might be, you know, if the E-Trans system hadn't been updated or on the payback, there's something that happened in the process, they may have to try, uh, and you may hear from your existing lender. So if you went to a lender, applied, gave the money back, and then asked the lender today, hey, can I reapply? Their answer may be no, uh, and then you're good. But I don't know that I would take that as being the ultimate truth, and it may be time to find a different lender to do it. And I think overall, if you can't find a lender locally, uh, there are FinTech options to this. Uh, you know, uh, uh, biz to credit is one that I know, Eric, you – I uh, know some of the folks over there at Vista Credit. Uh, I'm not sure if they're still taking loans. Uh, Intuit at one time was doing it. Square, uh, a bunch of POS systems. So it may be an electronic fintech option rather than a brick and mortar bank that you find as an available lender. Yeah, I know Vista Credit is still uh, taking loans. That's something we're thinking about. We may just uh, uh, put a list of a couple of the fintechs or, or some banks that we know that are still uh, taking new applications. A lot of the banks uh, now are taking new customers. In the first few weeks, they only supported their existing customers due to the uh, you know KYC laws and, and, and things like that. But now it's been more broadly opened up. So banks are taking new customers, and the fintechs are obviously taking new customers like Biz to Credit. Thank you both. Um, let's see, We've got a lot of questions Lisa, coming I, in. I so want just, to go back. Yeah. yeah, Lisa, I want to go back to the first question about the IDLE versus the PPP, because you've done a lot of work on this, and you actually asked Treasury if there's some way to get it on the application. And, and we were given some uh, level of assurance that SBA has the ability to track those IDLE loans. Uh, and so while it won't show up on the application, there still will be this expectation that any idle advance that you receive will get backed out of the amount that they're going to forgive. So just because they may not have heard from SBA at this point doesn't mean that at some point SBA is going to be looking for that money. Uh, and so we're not sure how it's going to look or, or what. But uh, there is that level. Um, and I've heard from a variety of members uh, that, you know, their clients have gotten the idle advance uh, well after they got their PPP. What do they do with it? Or they, they have uh, the idle loan that Doug talked about. And how does that play with this? And it doesn't. But you still have to make some level of awareness. So we're, we know that this process has not been the smoothest. Um, but you know, it's going to be, at the end of the day, it is going to eventually work its way out, and that's where we can help our client is making sure they do the right thing at the right time, and any advance that they would have received, know full well, even though they haven't asked for it yet, they're going to. Hey, Mark, and Lisa, another question here, just, and this is, this is a client who prepaid, who repaid the PPP loan due to, you know, some concerns. 
and and now one question they have is you know they're they're thinking of of applying. Is there any uh, updates regarding uh, will they be able to you know you use the FOIA request to trump what Mnuchin said? And that's uh, unknown. Uh, so th it sounds like uh, tre Treasury and, and the SBA are going to try um, uh, to, to keep it uh, confidential. There's been statements around that. That's something that we will watch. And I think that just it's a, it's a continued uh, you know client risk discussion uh, for you to have uh, with your clients. But there it, there's potential that they will not be disclosed. So that maybe that that gives them uh, enough enough. Uh, uh, comfort to move forward with with the application based on the, their current situation. Maybe their situation has has gotten worse, and uh, they based on that, as long as you document, you know, the all the reasons why, you should be able to answer those questions uh, to the local media or, or to whoever would be asking. And, and everybody should uh, you know, understand in this world that you know business relief is needed. And we put a blog out a while ago on th this concept of naming and shaming and how we thought that was not helping uh, do what the intent of the PPP Act was. So Lisa, additional questions? Yes. Um, there's still some questions about idols and if you had an application in process but haven't heard back. And it's my understanding from listening to the testimony at the uh, committee yesterday that once those applications start making their way through the portals, there should be additional coming out for the borrowers. And there was also a question about if you don't think your, your EIDL loan is going to make it through the portal, uh, are there other SBA options that you should look at? And Doug, I know that's a, a general question, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, so once again, SBA's main lending program, the 7A program, is for working capital. Um, and, and those loans are up to $5 million. Uh, the, their 504 program is for fixed assets. And microloan uh, program is for uh, very small firm seeking very small amounts. So all three programs are uh, available and funded. Hey, Doug, just one question yeah. with that, and I think it's a good question for people to ask because it, there's just not a lot of guidance around EIDL. They've processed a million applications for an EIDL loan, and there's still four million outstanding. That may or may not include the agriculture that were uh, limited in the last number of weeks, but there's still a lot in the backlog of, uh, you know, existing everyday clients that they may still end up seeing this money. Is that right? Yeah. Um, we don't know. We, we do know that there's over 4 million applications pending. We do, I don't know, and I don't know if anyone on the call knows, how you know what is the the requested aggregate amount? I don't think SBA has published that number, um, but there is about you know it's two according to my calculation is 287 billion dollars available under idle right now, um, and the question becomes is that enough to to fund? Four million loans. I mean, that's a huge amount of loans. The point of comparison is under PPP, they've done, uh, you know, north of five million loans now, totaling about 500 billion. So an average loan size there, just a, a bit north of 100k. So if the same holds true for disaster loans, um, they should be in uh, well. That that would be that would be 400 billion, right? So they might exhaust all of the current funds that they have with the uh, uh, w with the loans that are currently pending. But again, I think it's so if your loan to the, yeah, if your loan number yep. is somewhere under three million, you have a chance. Yeah. Incidentally, I, you know, and you guys may have talked about this in some of your your, your past webinars, but I do not think that the federal government is done providing stimulus to the economy. Uh, I, I think we're going to see, you know, CARES 4.0 come along at some point, probably in July. 
Yes, absolutely. We've been talking about that, Doug. I briefly mentioned a couple of things today. If you know, if we call it CARES 2.0 or you know, business uh, or the Phase Four program, right, and phase we, four, right. there will be something, and it, we just know there'll be probably more conditions. And there's there's that we the government moved fast uh, during April. Uh, they needed to. It's going to be a little bit slower now. Uh, but we're going to continue to track that weekly as we continue just to discuss all of the existing relief programs and, and um, updates that occur with them and changes that occur with them. So I think we're, uh, at least unless there's one, one final question, I think we can move to uh, our final slides and talk about, you know, the resources uh, that we have uh, available to all of these attendees. Let me share just a bit of good news. We had a, a comment that someone had applied for an idol on April 9th and got notice that they were approved on June 8th. So there's some good news to close out and move on to the, the other slides. Excellent. And as Doug said, lot, we're expecting a lot more information on idol uh, processing next week uh, based on what uh, the SBA has reported. So first off here, this is the Resource Center, probably the the most visited page on, on the AICPA website today, it's AICPA.org uh, backslash SBA. Uh, it's got the forgiveness calculator. It's got the original uh, loan uh, amount PPP calculator. It, it has links to the upcoming town halls. There's questions about our past town halls. We'll make sure there's, there's an easy, easy to find link there because all of those are up and other resources that we have. We've got a number of different, you know, matrices. Uh, Mark, uh, do you want to co comment on this one briefly? Sure. Um, you know, well, there's nothing new to it, Eric. We've talked about this quite a bit. As forgiveness comes out, here are your uh, options as far as the types of services, depending on what your client level is today. Uh, so uh, this is one of the resources on the website. It's one of the most downloaded resources. So I suggest getting this so that you can see, and there's great engagement letters, sample reports about doing agreed upon procedures. So uh, really good stuff to help support you through the forgiveness process. Thanks, Mark. And more broadly, we've got a coronavirus tax resource center, uh, which has uh, you know, also lots of different um, you know, charts and capabilities to help guide you through uh, these many different uh, options. We've got other webcasts. You can find all of these at, at, on the AICPA store. We're just highlighting a couple uh, here that we think uh, are relevant uh, for this, this audience. And just finally here, we're going to continue uh, to update our resources, hold these town halls every week, it's such a critical time for us to be connecting with you. Once again, your questions have been very helpful. We're going to take them all back in-house and leverage them to drive some of our future guidance and future topics here at the town hall. Uh, so thank you for your time today. And next week, we're actually going to talk a little bit about pricing and value. And we're going to have another practitioner with us. And we're going to have Ron Baker, who many of you know, he, he actually uh, is at a firm, uh, top 100 firm today, and he's been leading uh, value pricing and pricing strategies for the profession for a long time. So we'll, we'll get his perspective on how best to support uh, your clients uh, during this very, very uh, critical uh, moment. So thank you for your time today. Have a great night, a good weekend, and we look forward to staying in touch. That's, and I would like to also thank Doug Cristello uh, from Grant Thornton. Uh, thanks for your partnership here, and thanks for all of your insights. And obviously, thanks to Mark and Lisa and the AICPA team uh, who put together uh, this week's uh, webinar. Thank you.